questions. And I want to, I want to uh, thank Melissa and the Reading Public Library for putting a series of exciting presentations together. Um, the library has been a godsend during this pandemic for myself and I know many of you. So thank you uh, very much. Tonight's program is gonna be different from last year's and I'm gonna take you on two virtual tours around the area to places I hope you'll consider going yourself. And then I'll finish up with some of our local birds. Um, before I begin though, I do want to give thanks to some people who have kindly offered me the use of their photographs. Mike Densmore, Stan Deutsch, Barbara Merrill, Bob Mitten, Bob Siciliano have been very kind and generous. They're excellent photographers, photographers who've been on many bird walks with me. And again, I really appreciate it. Winter is a tough time, not only for us, but for all living things. It takes a lot of effort to get through the winter. If you're this Robin, you're gonna look for all kinds of ways to survive and get through this. Well, we're gonna talk about some birds first that you could see if you took a tour of Cape Ann. Now, I know many of you have been to Gloucester and Rockport and Anasquam in the summer and have enjoyed Long Beach and Good Harbor and all of that. But did you know that Cape Ann is a magnet for bird watchers? People come from all over the East Coast to look for winter specialties. So I'm gonna show you a bunch of birds that you could see. I want you to realize that the birds I'm gonna show you are not specific to any one of these locations, but you could see them at any of them. So we are gonna start at Halibut Point State Park. Halibut Point State Park is co-managed by the DCR and the trustees of the reservation. It's an old granite quarry and the bluff you walk out on sits up really high and gives you a spectacular view to the north and to the east. Since you're up high, you can sometimes look down on the birds. And this is a flock of common eider. Those of you who are bird watchers, might be able to pick out something that's a little different right here, a couple of white winged scoters. Um, one of the main attractions of going to Cape Ann is to find harlequin ducks. These beautifully colored males are a blast to watch. They're very close to shore, diving, really close to, amongst the waves, close to shore, looking for mollusks and small crustaceans to eat. And they pull out, look at those gorgeous colors. They're just a lot of fun. And I can almost guarantee you that if you go up to Cape Ann and stop at some of these locations, you'll be able to see some of these birds. Another neat bird is the long-tailed duck. And if you look at the lower right, you can see where they get that name. The males have that long, thin tail. Um, they've got the beautiful pink in the bill, just a gorgeous black and white sea duck. You'll often see these ducks in big mixed flocks, um, sometimes five, six different species. And here is uh, some harlequin ducks and two long tailed ducks in the lower right. You always want to keep your eye to the sky when you're on the ocean, and you might find one of these visitors. This is a northern gannet. This is an adult male. Some bird is referred to it as the flying cross because it looks very cross-like, very pointed when it flies. And there's a picture of one sitting on the water. These birds are the ones that dive, fold their wings and dive into the water and swim after fish such as herring and mackerel and uh, whitefish and other fish like that. Now our next stop will be just around the corner at Andrews Point. Rockport prides itself on providing access to the water via public footpaths. This is wonderful. The challenge is to find legal parking. And I'll talk about that in a minute. You ought to 
Andrew's point, and again, it's looking east and northeast. Now you're really just a little bit above the water and you can get some great looks at birds moving, uh, especially early in the morning. And sometimes you'll find great big flocks or rafts of ducks. And this is a raft of common eider. And mixed in there, for some of you sharp-eyed people, is a winter specialty that birders are forever looking for, a male king eider. Just a spectacular looking bird that breeds way up in the Arctic North. This is a common eider, adult male on the left. And sometimes you'll find the king eider as it looks in its first winter there on the right. So this is what it looks like as a full adult. And that's the same bird as an immature male. The females are a beautiful cinnamon brown color. If you see them in the light, I, I think they're one of the most spectacular of all of our sea ducks. Uh, just they're gorgeous in their simplicity. Now, as I mentioned, Andrew's point, uh, you can enter it if you can park. There's been some controversy Parking has been banned in some streets. So if you go up there, you want to look for Linwood Ave. It's two streets from the water. Drive down there about 50 yards, and you'll see a area where you can park legally, and then you can walk the block and a half back to Andrews Point. Our next stop is going to be the Granite Pier, or Old Granite Pier. You don't have to worry about parking here, as this is over 100 yards long and present some wonderful views to a small inner harbor and then out to the uh, east and southeast. Now, this is, a, again, these ducks are called scoters, are not unique to Old Granite Pier. They're a bird you are gonna see in the winter. Um, so keep your eyes open no matter where you go. But there are three species of scoter, the black scoter, the white wing scoter, and the surf scoter. I want you to take a look at that surf scoter. See that clam in his mouth? All of these scoters are going to eat mussels and clams. And on occasion, uh, other mollusks or snails. Look at that bill. Here's a white winged scoter in flight. You can see where it got its name, that great big white patch. It's, there's a speculum and that white comma under the eye. And scoters can often be found in big flocks. These are the male surf scoters and one female. Notice the male has a white spot on its forehead, big white patch on the back of its head. And look at that odd shaped multicolored bill. They usually actually use that bill when they dive underwater to pry the muscles off of a muscle bed or a clam out of the sand. These birds are often seen fairly close to shore because they don't really like to dive much more than 25 to 30 feet. And as I said, you'll see big flocks. Um, last winter and the winter before, it would not be unusual to see two, three, four thousand of them. This year, they've been more spread out, but all three species of scoter are in this photograph. Can you pick them out? There are females there that I didn't really talk about, but look right in the center. You can pick out the male black scoter, small, jet black, orange bill, just to its left, a white wing scoter with that white comma in the eye, and just behind them, the skunkhead or surf scoter. Another of my favorite birds is the sea goose or a brant. Brant are only found along our coast in the winter. Uh, they breed much further north. They're just a beautiful, beautiful goose. All right, our next stop is going to be along Atlantic Ave. Um, I'm sure many of you have driven this lots of times. In the winter, it is okay to park at the Elks Club. This is where this shot is taken from. Just drive to the back of the parking lot so that you don't uh, interfere. You'll often, right in front of you, see big flocks of 20, 30, 40, 
bufflehead. These are tiny black over white ducks, at least the male is. And um, the female is black over gray with a little white face patch. This is a good place to see some winter birds known as grebes. On the left is the larger redneck grebe, and on the right is a horned grebe. It, on the left is a horned grebe, and actually the bird on the right is a rather rare bird called an eared grebe. I happened to get that picture last year. And here's a horned grebe. These are little birds. Horned grebes you can find on inland bodies of water. I've seen them on Lake Kwanapawak before. And again, these are the redneck grebes. It won't have that red neck until it enters its bleed, breeding plumage. Most of the time we don't get to see that. You'd have to travel north to their breeding grounds. Another bird that bird watchers always want to put on there to-do list of purple sandpipers. And again, Atlantic Ave can be a wonderful place to see them at low to mid tide. Um, these birds will forage amongst the rocks and the seaweed and rack line. They, they're rather dark appearing and they have yellow orangey feet or legs. Now, one of the, the biggest attractions for visiting bird watches is to head to our coast and look for the penguins of the north. These are birds in the family known as alcids. They're related to ox, auklets, murres, murlets. And pictured here are three of the more common ones. Um, so let's take a look at these for a minute. First, we'll look, take a look at the razor bill. This is a big, thick, heavy black bill with a thin line on it. You're gonna notice that most of these birds are black on white. So this is what it looks like in the winter, but this is what they look like up off of Machaya Sea Island in Maine in the summer. So winter, summer, not too different. Get a neat picture. Uh, now, th this is a thick billed myrrh. The bill is a little thinner than a razor bill, and it's black over white, very blocky looking to my eye. The, towards the back of the bird, you'll sometimes see a little white patch. And if you get a good close look, I don't know if I can, uh, let's see if I can do this. Uh, it's not working. Okay. Bird watches will sometimes. You see this little white line right here? It's called a gape line. And you can often pick that out through your binoculars. Um, so that could help you in identifying these birds. This is um, thick billed murres on their breeding grounds up in Maine. Here's a relative of theirs, the common murr. Again, we have a common murr on the left. The bird standing up as a common myrrh, and then three razor bills. And I took this picture on uh, Machias sea lion a few years ago. This is the only photograph I have of a common myrrh. For me, this is the myrrh that I have more difficulty finding. Uh, I usually find thick billed myrrhs more often. This is the alcid that people love to find because it's so tiny. This is about a foot long. This Little tiny football like bird is a dove key. Look at the tiny bill. Again, the black over white plumage. Um, all of these alcids dive under the water. Again, they're looking for fish, crustaceans, things like that to eat. Black guillemot is the other alcid. This is how, what it looks like in its winter plumage. Look at this great shot here, grabbing a fish and swallowing them. Again, I can't thank all the photographers enough for letting me use the photographs. And this is what they look like up off the coast of Maine in the summer. Look how jet black they are in the summer. And this is what they look like in the winter. And here's a group of uh, 
six or seven, just off a dock I was sitting on in East Boot Bay Harbor a couple of summers ago. And if you're really, really lucky and in the right place at the right time, which I haven't been, you might find an Atlantic puffin. Um, they're rarely seen from shore, Cape Ann. Your best bet to find them is to go out on a wintertime pelagic trip. And I took one out of Gloucester five years ago, and this is a winter plumaged Atlantic puffin. So that's what they look like up in Maine in the summer. That's what they look like now, if you got to see one. Another visitor from the north are great cormorants. Anywhere along Atlantic Ave can be a good place to find these big cormorants. They uh, have a white throat patch. And these birds here are getting some white feathers in the back of the head and down by their butt. That white patch near the butt's called a brood patch. And every year we'll get uh, a small number of these along Cape Ann. Our next stop is going to be um, Niles Pond and Braces Cove. Again, parking can be a challenge here. So if you go here, please be careful uh, and park legally. When the pond is unfrozen, it can hold a lot of ducks. This is really true in November, December, and sometimes into January. And two of the species that will flock, you know, work this pond are greater scop and lesser scop. We have the males on the left and females on the right. And they present a real identification challenge for all bird watchers. It is never a shame just to put down on your list scop species. Now, what I try to do is to focus in on the shape of the head. If you look at the greater scop, the male, let's say, its head is kind of rounded. And if it has a peak or a high point, it's really right above the eye. Now drop down and look at the lesser scop. Its head is more squared off or blocky. And if it's got a peak, it's towards the back of its head. So that's what I use to try to identify them. And even that doesn't work all the time, especially when these birds are diving and they come up and they've got their heads and feathers are soaking wet. Another neat duck is a ring neck duck. You'll never see the ring around its neck because that really is only formed during the breeding season, but you should be able to find that white ring around the bill. The males are dark over gray, the females are dark over brown, and the females have that white crescent right at the base of their bill. Often you'll see these birds in mixed flocks. Um, here are some buffle heads on the upper left and ringneck ducks. Ringneck ducks sometimes can be a challenge to identify, but one of the things you wanna look for, especially at a distance, uh, is this, what I call spur. See that white part in the front juts up? That is diagnostic of a um, ringneck duck. This is Braces Cove. You look out towards the ocean again, you'll see a nice variety of ducks at times there. This is a wonderful place to see harbor seals hauled out on the rocks. And sometimes in that rack line there, you'll find these guys, American pipits. Um, one of these pictures is taken two weeks ago. And our next stop is gonna be Easton Point. Um, now, if you go on to Easton Point, don't be scared off by the big sign that says private. Yes, most of it is, but you're gonna go down to the end to where the Coast Guard station is. And that parking lot you see there is owned by Mass Audubon and it's perfectly legal to park there and bird. You could even walk out onto that dog fish bar, which I'm too chicken to do. But um, again, you've got a nice look at the uh, outer harbor 
and all kinds of neat ducks can frequent here. These are red-breasted merganses. The brightly colored males are on the right and the more drab female is on the left. In full sun, this is clearly one of the prettiest ducks going with that gorgeous bill, that bedhead kind of look. Um, just a, a neat bird. This is a good place to see common loons. Yes, these are common loons. This is what you might think they are. And yes, that's what they look like in the summer. But in the winter, this is their winter plumage. Notice a big, thick neck, big, blocky head, and that big, thick, dagger-like bill. Same proportions there. Now, we all know that loons breed on great big inland bodies of water, and then they all fly to the ocean to spend the winter. Well, the young of the year will actually spend up to 16 months along our coast and won't return to their natal breeding grounds until they're two years of age. The other loon you want to be on the lookout for is the red throated loon. Now, no, it doesn't have a red throat. You're gonna to have to come back for my elastica presentation to see some red throated loons in breeding plumage. But this is what they look like in the winter, a thinner neck, a thin bill that's angled slightly upwards. And they tend to sit rather low in the water. Like the common loons, they dive and are looking for eels, crabs, small fish, and the like. Our last stop is going to be at the Jodry State Fish Pier. The Jodry State Fish Pier is a working fish pier. Gloucester is one of the biggest fishing ports in the East Coast. So when you're here, you're looking out into the harbor, over to your left are lots of docks of fishing boats, and over to your right is another big dock where boats come in and unload the fish. Please stay away from there. Never go out on the docks. These people make their living from fishing, and they don't need us underfoot. Here's a look back towards Jodry Fish Pier, which is around that, those blue buildings there, just to give you a scope of Gloucester Harbor. A main attraction for many people who go to Jodry Fish Pier are the gulls. You have an opportunity to find what birders refer to as white-winged gulls, Iceland gulls and Glaucus gulls. Those are two they're looking for, and in the middle there, with his head tucked, is an Iceland gull. The Iceland gulls, a mature one on the right, and one that's a year or two old on the left. This is a big glaucous gull in the middle. This is an adult glaucous gull. This bird was picture was taken up in Hampton Beach. He liked to sit on the top of a building up there for a couple of years. And on the right is the biggest gull in the world, the great blackback gull. And to its left is a glaucous gull. Again, another really big gull. The great blackback gull is a voracious predator and scavenger. That is a, uh, unfortunately, a coot that it caught and killed. And on occasion, you'll pick up some rare gulls, such as this black-headed gull. I'd urge you not to just say, ugh, gulls, and walk away. They are a neat bird. They're wonderful parrots. They're very social birds. They're very intelligent. They're really survivors. And it's a great way to practice your bird identification skills, because some of these birds, it takes three and four years to reach their sexual maturity. So in each year, their plumage is gonna be looking a little differently. There are four different species of gulls here. So the bird watchers in the audience, I bet you can pick them out. See the bird facing us in the upper middle, pink legs, that's an Iceland gull. Just behind it, a male, great black back gull. Those brownish gulls, those are herring gulls, they're young. 
over to the far left with his bill wide open is a adult herring gull. And just below that is a smaller ring billed gull. So this is the sort of situation you'll find up at Joby where you could find three, four, sometimes five species of gulls. Now, I get asked this question a lot. Why don't birds' feet freeze in the winter? They're standing on the ice. I mean, what's going on? Well, two big things. One, the feet are a little more than just bone, sinew, and scale. They've got very few nerves. And then there is an amazing adaptation uh, in Latin, lite mirabile. It's Latin for wonderful net. And what it means is a fine net-like pattern of arteries that interweaves blood from a bird's heart with the veins carrying cold blood from its feet and legs. The system cools the blood so that little blood that goes down to the feet is already cold. So the birds don't lose much heat. So now you know when you see a group of ducks or geese or gulls on the ocean, why their feet don't freeze. Now that ends our first virtual tour. And again, I'd urge you to hop up in your car, head up 128 North and take Route 127 or Route 127A and enjoy the scenery. Stop at Charlie's for a bowl of fish chowder afterwards. Um, it's just a good time. Any quick questions before we move on? We had a couple come in through the chat. Um, okay. Someone asked, uh, this was uh, around the halibut point part of the presentation. Um, someone was wondering if you need a scope to see the birds there. Um, no and yes. Many times if you're out on that bluff at halibut point, the ducks are literally right below you and you can see them with your naked eye. Binoculars are really beneficial um, and a, a good camera can help as well. Now, anytime you're at the ocean doing seabird viewing, a scope is really valuable. Um, so if you have access to a scope, um, take advantage of it, but don't cancel your trip just because you don't have one. Oh, right. And we have another question. Um, why do puffin bills change color? Um, birds molt once or twice a year. The molting is done to grow new and healthy feathers. And it's also done to in the uh, uh, pre breeding time to have so the birds will develop their feathers that they're going to use for uh, breeding purposes. They use these colorful feathers to attract um, the, the, to attract a mate. The same is true with a puffin's bill. They use that bill as part of their courtship process to attract a, a mate. So over time, that bill is going to just break down and wear out. And so it's, uh, I don't know the proper term for it. It's not molting, but um, th that's a general answer to your question. And then one more from the chat. Uh, where's Charlie's? It's down near Good Harbor. Um, I don't know the name of it. Google Charlie's Gloucester. They're open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, have you ever heard of Cod Cheeks? Great. They're one of the only places I know that have Cod Cheeks. My friend Mark Nelson introduced me to Charlie's a number of years ago, and I can't go up there now without visiting it. And All right. Well, we are going to move on to our second virtual tour, and that's going to be to the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. Many of you refer to it as Plum Island. On this map, the refuge is outlined in that reddish brown line. It's over 4,500 acres in size. It comprises the ocean, beautiful six mile barrier beach, a magnificent maritime dune forest, freshwater marsh, vernal pools, saltwater marsh, 
the amazing Plum Island Sound with four rivers flowing into it. It's an absolutely incredible place. The majority of the 4,500 acres is salt marsh. And salt marsh marshes have the third most biodiversity in the world, only followed behind coral reefs and rainforests. So it's just an amazing place. I can't urge you enough to come up here and visit. Um, when they have somebody at the gate, it costs $5 to get in, but there are some alternatives, uh, passes and the like that you can purchase. Uh, you have a six and a half mile long road. The first three and a half miles are paved. The last three miles are dirt and it ends up at the end of Sandy Point, which is a state of Massachusetts um, property. So here we are early in the morning, ready to enter the refuge. You go in the gate and on your left is a big parking lot. Park there, get out of your car and walk across the street to the boat ramp. Now again, remember this is presentations on winter birds. So that's what the focus is going to be. But I will say, if you are a kayaker or a canoe, come on up here and um, put your kayak or canoe in in the summer. It's beautiful. They've got a kayak trail out there. This is the Plum Island River. Often it is unfrozen. You'll hear me use the word open. I mean unfrozen when I say that. And a great place to see all kinds of ducks. Here are some American black ducks in the extensive salt marsh out behind them. Common golden eyes can be found here. These are beautiful birds. They have this white, the males have a white patch on their face that is below the eye. And on a very rare occasion, you might find a barrow's golden eye. This is on the left. It's got that white crescent-like patch that goes up and above the eye. I often see golden eyes right here when the water is not frozen. Another thing to keep on the lookout for in the winter are the behavior of ducks. Winter is the time of courtship for ducks. Many of these ducks, by the time they leave for their winter breeding grounds, will have a mate and they'll migrate north together. These ducks will go through all kinds of contortions, especially the males, pumping their head up and down, throwing their heads right onto their back and making different grunts and sounds. Look at that hooded meganza there on the right. You see that big white crest, they'll raise and lower it. Uh, if they're having a challenge with another male. Um, these long-tailed ducks, if you go to the Joppa Flats headquarters in the end of March, middle of March to early April, and you walk out back and look at the Merrimack River, sometimes you can see hundreds of long-tailed ducks. That's a staging area for them. And you'll see them cavorting about. It just it really is a cool sight. Now, from parking lot one, walk up the boardwalk and you'll get an amazing view of the Atlantic Ocean looking east. This is looking southeast along the beach. Remember this beach is six miles long. Um, just a great place that can walk this all winter long. Um, no dogs are allowed south of this photograph. North of this photograph, they are. Now, if you turn around, you'll look out back over the boat ramp and the marsh. And just this little bit of extra added elevation can really provide different opportunities such as this. This is a Northern Harrier or marsh hawk. Back up until about the 1960s or early 70s, they actually bred on the refuge, but no longer. Um, most of these birds breed much further north and west. The bird on the left and in the lower right is an uh, adult male Northern Harrier. Look at that beautiful gray plumage with the black wingtips. Bird is referred to this as the gray ghost. And the bird in the upper right is a female. It's got that uh, beautiful golden color. Another bird you can see in the winter from up on parking lot one is the bald eagle. 
This was taken on one of my bird walks a couple of weeks ago. This guy was sitting right in the top of a light pole right at the entrance. Just a stunning bald eagle. This is an immature eagle in flight. Eagles switch their diet from fish to ducks. They, they like nothing better than to grab a black duck or a mallard and we uh, a Canada goose. You'll see them perched in trees and right out on the river. They'll drift on ice flows. It's the great place to see them in the winter. Mass Audubon, the town of Newburyport, and the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge will be sponsoring Eagle Festival the second week in February. So you might want to go online, go online and check that out. There's all kinds of events and uh, guided walks and whatnot. Now, as we get back in our car and head south along the road, the Plum Island River will be on our right. And again, when it's not frozen, you'll find ducks. Now, my favorite is the American black duck. This is the duck of our New England salt marshes. Very few nest here anymore in um, Northeast Massachusetts due to loss of habitat, habitat degradation, and interbreeding with mallards, these birds are being forced further north. Now, how can you tell a black duck in flight? Well, there are two things, three things. One is the uni overall uniform dark color of that bird. The second thing, which this photograph doesn't show, is the silver white lining of their underwing. So when it's in flight, it can contrasts nicely with that dark body. The third thing is that color patch on the wing known as a speculum. Notice that it's a solid blue. Now, look at this mallet. I took this picture over at Han Pond, standing on one of the bridges in winter when all the ducks were accumulated there. Look at their color patch. See that it's white, blue, white. So in flight, you can use the color and color pattern of the speculum of ducks to help identify them. On occasion, not too often, but on occasion, you might find common merganses. They have the long sawtooth bill, they dive and they catch fish. Look at the herring that guy in the upper left caught. He's trying to swallow it and these other guys are trying to steal it from him. Northern pintail can be found in the winter when the marsh is open, meaning unfrozen. Look at the beautiful male duck on the right, chocolate brown head, that long white stripe. And look at its speculum color pattern there. All right, we'll head down the road. We'll come to Boardwalk 2. This long boardwalk will take you right out to the ocean. That's where it's located. I'll have these maps just to give you a point of reference. And this is a top boardwalk too, looking back out over the extensive marsh and the Plum Island Sound out to your left. Canny bird watches will often hang out here for a while in the winter and scope for various raptors, such as this guy. This is a peregrine falcon, and I know the photograph isn't great, but I put it in because you'll often see them perched on things such as this nesting box. Is an immature peregrine falcon, and look at this photograph Mike took of a peregrine in flight the fastest bird in the world. And they're up there picking off ducks and doves and pigeons and other things. A little further on, you come to the salt pans, probably a hundred yards long, you can just pull over. And this is a wonderful place for beginners to bird when that water is open. A salt pan is a very shallow depression that once or twice a month, depending on the tides, will fill up with water and then slowly drain out. So when it has water in it, you might find ducks when the water drains out. In the summer and fall, you'll find sandpipers. 
So that's about where the salt pans are. Here's looking out again in a little different direction. And again, as you drive along the road and you look out in the marsh, you could come across lots of geese. Once in a while, you'll find a snow goose. See in the center, that white goose. And on rare occasion, you'll find a blue goose. Now a blue goose is nothing more than a dark morph snow goose. And this guy hung out at the refuge for a while uh, in the late fall. Sometimes we can find gadwall. Again, another duck that's beautiful in its simplicity. And as you drive along the road, often you'll see northern mockingbirds. These guys often hang out near big stands of berries, such as this winterberry bush. And they're very, very protective. This is their bush. And by golly, if you're a robin or a cedar waxwing or a starling and you try to go in there for a snack, they'll chase you right out. Yellow rump warblers, believe it or not, overwinter. Um, you, you always will have a good chance of seeing two or three on the refuge. These birds have the ability to switch their diet from insects to fruit. Now, we are gonna then drive down the road and we're gonna pull off on the side of the road. There is no parking at North Field. And we'll check out the trees and we're gonna look for a small falcon like this. This is called a Merlin. And we'll often find these birds zipping about the refuge looking for smaller birds to prey upon. And again, in the winter, on occasion, we'll find northern shrikes. There has been one around in Northfield, often on the last month. This bird is a predator. It will hunt small birds, like chickadees and sparrows, kill them, impale them on a thorn or broken branch or piece of barbed wire, and come back and eat them later. Thus its name, the butcher bird. We're now gonna pull in to the, uh, the wardens. What it is is the uh, maintenance area for the refuge staff. And if you look between those two buildings, that parking area, it's not available to us, but it's all gravel and sand. And this is an area is the, where can attract snow buntings. You'll sometimes see them in big flocks, 50, 60, 80. Or sometimes you'll see them in singletons, like these two perched up on one of the roofs. They eat seeds. That's one of the reasons they'll zip through this maintenance area, looking for grass seeds that may uh, get blown up. And often you'll see them in the beach grasses, like this flock. And they're jumping up, landing on these grass stalks, knocking the seeds out of them and eating them. This is a place to find horned locks. Look at the beautiful yellow face and the black patterning. And on occasion, you'll find a Lapland longspur. These are a sparrow-like bird from the far north that on occasion will show up. Look at the colors on that, huh? Just a beautiful bird. White crowned sparrows, this is an adult, might be around. In American tree sparrows, they have that rusty cap. Look at the bill, the bottom part, that lower mandible is brighter colored. A clear breast with a faint central spot. These birds will get into flocks, not huge flocks, but flocks of six, eight, 10, 12. And they've got a beautiful little musical note that you can often hear. We're gonna drive down the road, and this is where the pavement ends, at the Hellcat Trail parking lot. My guess is with this big storm we're gonna get, it, the refuge will be closed for a day or two. They'll plow all of the paved surfaces, but they do not pave south of Hellcat. So just keep that in mind if you go to visit and there's snow on the ground. Now, the big attraction is where Hellcat's located, is the Hellcat Trail Boardwalk. It is 1.4 miles in length. It has just been totally rebuilt to the tune of $4.2 million. 
and it is an example of something that the federal government got right. It's spectacular. It is fully ADA compliant. If you have any friends or relatives that have some mobility issues, this is where you want to bring them. Just a, a note, if it's been snowy or icy, be very careful. This is that Trex tech material. And if it's icy, don't do it. You walk along here, you're gonna be going through a maritime dune forest. You'll be jutting out into a freshwater marsh. Uh, you'll go through a vernal pool and you can actually walk out into the dunes. There's a nice overlook over, uh, overlooking the ocean. This is a fox sparrow. And here's where it crosses the road. There's handicapped parking on the right. White-throated sparrows abound up here. And if you're really, really lucky, and I never have been here, uh, you might find a yellow breasted chat. This is a, a little winter jewel that birders are always on the lookout for. This year has been a wonderful winter for yellow bellied sap suckers. Um, not only here in the refuge, but um, I've had them in my yard twice already this year. Um, a friend of mine has had them come to their feeder. So I don't know what's going on, but they are around. This picture I took at Plum Island in the summer and look at those holes. Those are called drill holes that the sap suckers deliberately put in there and they're going to get the sap to come out. They may eat some of that sap, plus that sap is going to attract insects and they might eat some of those insects and other birds will come in and eat those insects. See the wax wings can be found. Look at these two. Not the, it's a little dark, but this is part of their courtship behavior, passing a winterberry back and forth. And a couple of people this winter have been very lucky and seen a long-eared owl through here. Um, just a uh, very, very cool bird. All right, now we're gonna continue south. Let's pretend the dirt road is open. We'll look out over the marsh. And again, if it's open, meaning unfrozen, you might find some hooded McGanses out there. Look at the beautiful males with that white, brown, and black plumage. The females, a little more dull, but still pretty cool looking with that wonderful hairdo. You never know what you're gonna find roadside. These boys stopped traffic up there one day. Now, our next stop is gonna be by Cross Farm Hill. There is no parking. You just wanna drive real slow, scan the skies because this is a good area to find this winter visitor, a rough-legged hawk. These birds breed up in the Arctic. I'll show you some in my Alaska presentation that I saw sitting on a nest. Um, I have not seen one this winter. I just haven't been in the right place at the right time, but I know a lot of people who have been seeing them fairly regularly. The other bird that you might see once in a while when they start to show up, the short-eared owl. They come out at dusk and become very active at dusk. Um, once in a while, they'll be active during the day, but uh, this is a spectacular photo Mike took. Now, one of the big reasons to go to Plum Island in the winter, you guessed it, snowy owls. Now, if you're going to go on to the refuge, how do you find a snowy owl? The best way is to find the people looking for at the snowy owls. I'm not being fresh. The other thing to do is to scan the dunes. These birds want to take it easy during the day. So they're going to be hunkered down in the dunes. They're going to get in the lee side of something, a hunk of ice, a piece of driftwood, a small sand dune, or whatnot. So you want to walk along those boardwalks, one, two, three, and five, with a pair of binoculars and just scan. Now, 
If you come across a snowy owl, please enjoy it from a distance. There are occasions where over-enthusiastic bird watchers, photographers, and general nature lovers will get too close to these magnificent animals and can stress them out. So please show restraint. I'm gonna go back to this one. The picture in the upper left, typical. They love to sit on driftwood, things like that. If you've ever been to Plum Island, you know you drive along the causeway and you go by that decrepit pink house. Look at that. That was pretty cool. And then on the left, I wish I could say I'm holding that bird, but I'm not. Uh, Mass Audubon's Norm Smith is. He's getting ready to release it. Now, what do birds do when it's windy? Well, they face into the wind. So the moving ear doesn't ruffle their feathers. They stay low to the ground where wind speed is lower. And they stay in the lee of any object that can deflect the wind. They also move as little as possible. So in this diagram, you've got a windbreak. It could be anything. And they get, they're going to get in that protected zone known as the lee. This guy's hunkered down behind some washed up lobsterman's traps. This is the only flight shot that I've been able to get. Not very good, but it just gives you an image or an idea of these really special creatures. When it, the marsh is full of snow and ice, like it's going to be, finding owls out in the marsh is a real challenge. Um, how do you separate an owl from a hunk of ice? It's, it, it, you just have to be patient. Our last stop is going to be a parking lot seven, also known as Emerson Rocks. This is a huge rock pile, a couple hundred yards offshore that is fully exposed at low tide. This rock pile extends quite a ways underwater as well. So it holds lots of mollusks, snails and the like that sea ducks feed on. So it's a good place to see sea ducks. Notice the snowy owl hunkered down there. This is also a good place to find maybe some wintering uh, sandpipers. In this case, here are some sandalings. And the other winter sandpiper you might come across is the bird on the left, a dunlin. Notice it's darker. Its bill is a little longer and downturned compared to the sandaling on the right. Now, before we end this tour, I want to just briefly introduce you to Tom Wetmore. He's known as Mr. Plum Island. He birds on the refuge almost every day and has over 20 years of data that he and fellow birders have recorded. I'd urge you to Google him, take a look at his website, and um, you'll be fascinated. He looks a little like Santa Claus. If you see him up there, stop and say hi. He's a wonderful guy, very willing to share his knowledge with you in an interesting and unpretentious fashion. All right, so there are our two virtual tours introducing you to many of New England's neat winter birds, which we can see right here with less than a 40, 45 minute ride from Reading. I'd urge you to please try both of these and uh, let me know how you do. Before we move into the conclusion, are there any quick questions? Feel free to chat in or unmute yourself and ask. We have some coming in in the chat. Um, could you clarify the spelling of Tom Wetmore? W-E-T-M-O-R-E. -E. And what time of day is best? My pat answer is any time you can get birding. Um, you know, in the winter, do you want to be there at seven o'clock when it's three degrees? Uh, there's not a whole lot of upside to that. In the winter, you're going to see almost any of these birds any time of day. You can go up at two o'clock in the afternoon and still have a great time and see lots of birds. Um, and 
earlier we had a more a general similar question of is there a best time of day to see birds in winter and in any environment um really uh go when you're comfortable um tides don't play a huge role with these winter birds they'll move some of the sea ducks around a bit um but uh go when you can and are Iceland gulls originally from Iceland? Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, is, is a Connecticut warbler from Connecticut? No. Um, is it how the Iceland gull got its name? They are Iceland gulls in Iceland. Um, I'm sure it's got something to do with the naming it, but I do not know the entomology or his word history for that. I'll have to look that up. And what constitutes a valid sighting? Well, a valid sighting is whatever you want it to be. If you see a cardinal and you say, by God, that's a cardinal, then it is a cardinal. Now, if you want to submit that to a scientific database, such as Cornell's eBird, you're going to have to provide some justification for that sighting. That justification could take the form of a photograph, a video, an audio recording, or a written description, field notes, a field sketch. Take a sketch and highlight the parts of the bird that make you say, oh, it is such and such a bird. If you think it's a um, rare bird, you want to say why you ruled out other species. For instance, at my feeder the other day, I had a rusty blackbird. Why was it a rusty blackbird? Because I said it was. It was de declared a rare bird by eBird. So I provided photographic evidence and written evidence. And part of that evidence was, and I ruled out that it wasn't a common grackle because bing, 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 bing. I ruled out that it wasn't a red-winged blackbird juvenile male because bing, 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 bing. So I, I hope that helps you. Um, yeah, and um, could you please repeat the name of birds that would eat winter berries? Um, robins. Um, cedar wax wings. Now, I, 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 the person who asked this question, are you talking about winterberry, meaning the Iliax and the holly family, or just berries in the winter? If you're talking berries in the winter, there'll be cedar wax wings, robins, yellow rump warblers, hermit thrush, mockingbirds. If you're talking about the Iliax, winterberry, for some reason, those are not consumed a great deal. And if they are, it seems to be they're consumed later in the winter. And I have never been able to get a good explanation for why. The two best reasons are, one, uh, the, the, it takes so long for the toxicity of the berry to break down, or it takes a long time for the sugars to ferment and break down. So I hope that helps. Tell you what, why don't we move on? And as we head down the home stretch, the three big challenges all birds face in the winter are finding food, maintaining an elevated body temperature to stay warm enough to survive. Remember, most songbirds have a body temperature between 104 and 110 degrees that they must maintain. And then the birds have got to survive the night. How are they going to get through this Friday night? How are they going to get through this Saturday night with a nor'easter coming in? 18 inches of snow, 12 degrees, wind blowing 30 miles an hour. Put yourself in the feet of a cardinal and figure it out. It's a challenge. This guy's saying, oh boy, how am I going to get through the night? Well, Let's talk about food. Natural foods are by far and away the favorite. 
fruits, nuts, seeds, berries, and believe it or not, lots of insects, insect eggs, frozen insects, insect larvae. This little winter wren is in this tangle here. Is he eating the winterberry? I mean, the uh, bittersweet? No, he's eating the insects that are attracted to it. He's also uh, eating any small seeds that might fall underneath this thicket. I don't know if you can pick this out, but there are horned locks here. This was taken in an agricultural field off of Route 2 in Acton, and lots of birds will go in and eat the waste seed that's left over, or eat the insects that are attracted to this after being plowed. Our chickadees and downy woodpeckers, when they're not at our feeders, are out foraging. They're looking for insects and larvae and all kinds of things. This common red pole is foraging on these tiny seeds of this dead flower head. This is a winter plumaged black pole warbler that my friend Mark and I saw up in Rockport back in October. It's not eating the apple. They don't like fruit. Believe it or not, there were a huge amount of insects rising off this rotten apple, and it was picking off those insects. This red-bellied woodpecker will use that big, heavy chisel-like bill to explore for insects. This little brown creeper uses that long, thin, deep, curved bill to explore behind and under pieces of bark. This Midwestern visitor that shows up now and then is called a dick sizzle, and it is a seed eater. You'll often find it uh, near short grasses, flower beds, anywhere there might be some seeds. These juncos are seed eaters. And again, here's a picture of a hermit thrush that will take advantage of fruit in the winter. Is a cedar waxwing eating juniper berries? And I had to put this in. I know a lot of you don't care for starlings, but uh, I think they're such a cool looking bird in their winter plumage. And they use that long bill to probe into your lawn when it's exposed for grubs, insects, uh, even seeds. Now, bird feeding stations are a supplemental resource for birds, and they're going to be very important over the next uh, three, four days. Have any of you noticed the lack of blue jays at your feeders this year? I have. Um, and the big reason for that, from what I've read, is the um, lack of a healthy mast crop. Mast meaning seed, and in particular oak. I don't know about you, but the three or four white oaks I have in my neighborhood, there are zero acorns. So when there are no acorns, which is a primary food for these blue jays, they're gonna migrate. House finches love backyard feeding stations. Can you pick out the four or five species there? See the downy woodpecker on the suet? To the left are a couple of goldfinches. To the right are house finches and a couple of house sparrows. Everyone's got to eat, even this guy, is a Cooper's hawk. Of the titmouse pounding away on these till it broke open uh, a peanut, broke up the peanut into smaller pieces and flew off of them. And once in a while, you may get a rare visitor. This is a black-throated blue warbler that came to my feeding station the day before Christmas a couple of years ago. Now, mid-May, this is not a rare bird. We have them around here. But in the winter, pretty neat. Carolina wrens will come into the yard and they love suet. And again, on occasion, this time you will, we might get one or two red-winged blackbirds, maybe a grackle. I've had all three, brown-headed cowbird, a couple of uh, 
grackles and a couple of red winged blackbirds. But wait till the end of February and March, and then these guys will be migrating north and we'll sometimes get 150 at our feeders. And that's when people get upset because they'll empty a feeder in the course of a day. If you haven't had the opportunity, go up to the Ipswich River Sanctuary in Topsfield run by Mass Audubon. Bring a child and bring some bird seed and feed the birds by hand. Pretty cool. Now, the secret to surviving the night is feathers and fat. If you're a bird, fat is fit. The fat reserves are stored just under the skin, especially in the body area. The birds have to convert that fat into body heat. And during the night, many of the birds are gonna use a high percentage of their fat reserves. That means that when they wake up, right off the bat, they are gonna to have to feed. So surviving the night is about feeding during the day. Um, birds have got to keep their feathers healthy and they do this in two ways. One is to molt them periodically in a systematic method. And the other way is to groom them daily. Every bird will groom its feathers. They'll straighten them out. They'll clean them of parasites. They'll put a little bit of oil on them that is secreted from a vent towards their back. And again, all birds of all sizes will groom at least once a day. Now, where do the birds spend the night? Think about during the day today, the whole town of Reading, we had to have several thousand birds. Well, where are they? Where are they gonna go? So it could be under bridges, under the eaves of buildings, your houses, downtown, sheds, garages, but the vast majority of them are gonna get into thickets, um, big heavy stands of bushes, trees, shrubs, um, robins, red-winged blackbirds will go into swamps. If you go up to the town forest at dusk and walk out into the wetlands, you'll see big flocks coming in to roost at night. They'll take advantage of natural cavities or holes and they'll take advantage of um, man-made items such as these roosting boxes or even a uh, wreath. I've had birds on two or three occasions spend the night on a Christmas wreath. Now, geese and ducks, they're gonna fly into open water. If there is no open water, they're gonna move until they find open water. And there's safety in numbers in being in a big body of water. Coyotes and foxes can't uh, get to you. And when they're resting like this, um, they, they have an ability, it's called unihemispheric slow wave sleep. And that allows the birds to slide one hemisphere of their brain into deep sleep leaving the other hemisphere awake and alert. And the birds can actually turn this, you know, slow wave sleep on and off, depending on how safe their roost is. A very interesting and a unique adaptation. Now again, here are some different behavioral adaptations that birds use to stay warm. Shivering and fluffing, tucking, sunning, huddling, and on some instances, snow as insulation. Now on cold nights, birds fluff up their feathers for insulation to minimize heat loss. And they'll hunker down over their bare legs and feet to keep them warm. Most birds can't tuck their heads under their wings to sleep as we've been led to believe, but they can turn their head around and poke their beak under their shoulder feathers to keep warm. Birds can sit in the sun. I know that these birds are nocturnal, so they're gonna take advantage of the radiant heat during the day. Just like these house finches and this cardinal, 
will do as well. And here's a good example of that tucking that I was talking about. They just poke their beaks under their shoulder feathers to keep them warm. Often they'll tuck one leg. If you watch them long enough, they'll switch legs after a while. Again, all adaptations and you know, ways in which they can try to um, stay warm. Golden crown kinglets will huddle together. These birds are actually smaller than a chickadee. And this has been a good winter for them. If you go up to the town forest of Bear Meadow, I bet you'll come across one or two of these. How can you help the birds survive the winter? Well, a couple of suggestions is to put out bird feeders and keep them clean and well stocked. Scatter seeds in sheltered places. Not all the birds are going to go to your feeder, so throw them under thickets and brambles along uh, rock walls. Make a windbreak. Create shelter for the birds. Um, provide water and um, Landscape your yard for birds using a variety of native plants. i betting some of you in the audience attended the talk by Doug Telemi a couple of months ago, the library sponsored, and his book is an excellent resource for this. Here is an example of some of the things. I'm very proud of the two 60-year-old American holly trees I have out in my backyard. As you see in the upper right, they provide excellent shelter and um, <clears throat> food. The blue jay taking advantage of the food. It's a Carolina wren eating some uh, little suet balls. <coughs> Excuse me. Some of our uh, winter visitors here, the red-winged blackbird, common grackle in the upper right, a brown-headed cowbird. Keep your eyes open. Come the end of February, they'll show up in mass. The woodpeckers are around this year. I've had a hairy, two downies and a red bellied in my yard a lot. I had a yellow bellied sapsucker last week. I have not had a flicker yet, but I do know some folks in Reading who have. And the sparrows, a junco is in the sparrow family, song sparrow, white throated sparrow, in the house sparrow. Now again, if you're gonna have bird feeders, you're gonna have hawks come in and try to pick them off. And this beautiful Cooper's hawk came in and landed on the ground and chased some sparrows right in underneath my holly tree there. This beautiful little sharp shinned hawk, uh, I haven't seen one this winter. Unfortunately, their numbers are declining for various reasons. Now I wanna leave you tonight, letting you know that spring is coming. Well, I'm having some technical difficulties here, I'm sorry. But anyway, I wanted to play for you the song of the, or the hooting of the great horned owl. My wife and I heard a pair duetting two nights ago. Great horned owls will be mated and on their eggs by the first or second week of February. That's letting us know that spring is coming. Let me try one more time. Yeah. Sorry about that. So, oh, there it is. So even though we've got a lot of winter still in front of us, um, spring is coming at the bluebird of happiness. I hope all of you have a good winter. I hope this weekend, the snowstorm, uh, doesn't uh, bother you too much. And uh, I'd like to, again, thank these photographers for their kindness and their generosity in lending, letting me use their photographs. I know I'll be reaching out to them for subsequent presentations. And again, I'd like to invite you to join us on February 22nd 
as I take you on a 20 day tour of Alaska. Where we'll visit Nome, Barrow, Denali, Privlop Islands, Anchorage, the Kenai Peninsula, and more. So again, thank you all very much. And I'll stick around and answer any questions if you have them. Yeah, a few more came in from the chat. Um, one is there are quite a few varieties of suet. Uh, which flavors do you recommend to attract the most interesting birds? I like a suet that's got some nuts in it, peanuts, that kind of thing. Other people I know like the ones that have berries in them. If squirrels are a problem getting to your suet, get some of the uh, hot pepper laced suet. And that works pretty well. But my preference is one that has nuts in it. And um, someone asked, is it safe to feed birds now? Because there was concerns about avian flu fairly recently. <clears throat> yes, that's a good point. Um, most of the organizations that reported that eventually gave an all clear um, with the caveat that you really need to stay on top of cleaning your feeders. Uh, what do I mean by that? I would say every two or three weeks, if they're very, very heavily busy, uh, visited, maybe a little more than that. But um, yes, it is okay to feed. I'm feeding the birds. Um, I think I would encourage you to as well, if you're comfortable and willing to do what's necessary. And someone commented that they have a flicker visiting a feeder on their balcony in Stoneham. Oh, excellent. I, they're one of my favorite birds. I just think they're special. Um, a lot of those flickers do migrate and it's only a few that overwinter. So you are fortunate to have one. And um, so, yeah, let's open, open it open the floor to anyone who wants to chat in or unmute and ask a question, feel free to do so. Well, I think right. that about wraps it up then. Um, yeah, have, uh, have a great evening, everyone. I hope that you enjoyed the presentation and thank you again, Dave, for yet another wonderful presentation. And thank you, Melissa, for all of your work. Yeah. All right. And thank you all very much for coming out tonight and uh, hope to see you next month. Thank you, Dave. Very welcome. Great presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. You're very welcome. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Oh, Mary, how are you? Good, Thank thanks. You. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Great, great <clears throat> presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoy doing this. It's always nice to be amongst fellow bird watchers and bird enthusiasts. And uh, it's a, a good way to spend a cold winter's night. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you, Dave. It's good to see you. Good to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> no last second questions. What's the best bird people have had in their yard so far this year? Nobody's had any rare birds in their backyard yet? Anyone have a yellow-bellied sapsucker? 